please be seated. I'd like to invite up Andy and Judy Wagner who will be lighting our second Advent candle, the candle of peace. Good morning. Our Advent journey began with rules of the road. We are on the way to where God would have us be, and we're not there yet. But how shall we go? We shall go together as one body, living and trusting in one another. We shall go as this community of faith, working side by side, and leaning into the grace of God every step of the way. We shall go in peace. Isaiah says that in the days to come, the nation shall stream to the mountains of the Lord, and there they will beat the swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. There we will learn war no more. God will teach us peace. We light these first candles to burn as signs of peace and hope among all people. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, that God may teach us the ways of peace. What is something that you are really good at? Gracie, what's something you're really good at? You don't know. Ben? Sports. What sports in particular? Baseball, football, okay. Zach, what's something you're really good at? What's that? Soccer? All right, very good. Basketball? Eliana, anything you're really good at? Being silent. A master at being silent. Do you, Gracie, did you think of anything? Mm -hmm. All right, what are you good at? Soccer. Soccer? All right, so we've got two soccer. All right, a lot of sports here. Interesting. You're not good at school? All right, very well. Do you think that what you're really good at, you could teach to somebody who's not so good at it? Gracie, could you teach soccer to somebody that does not know how to play it? You could? All right. You got to stand up now. What is a key thing to remember in soccer? So there's people out here who don't know how to play soccer. You've got to help teach them. You don't know. Can you touch the ball with your hands in soccer? No. Not unless you're the goalie, right? The goalie can touch the ball. Right? So you'd have to teach somebody to use what part of their body to play soccer? Legs. The legs, the feet, anything that's not the hand, right? Okay, very good. Hmm. Zach, you're good at soccer too. What's something that you know you could teach to somebody else about soccer? What's something they really need to remember? You can dribble the ball to the goal. Okay, so the, the point is going to a goal. Which goal? Should it be your goal or the other team's goal? The other team's goal. Okay, well that's important. If you've never played soccer before, you might end up kicking it in your own net, right? So when we learn something, when we've been through something, we've learned how to do it, we can teach that to other people. Today, in the reading from the book of Romans, Paul, who's the guy who wrote that, he is telling the people who live in Rome that you've all learned something, you've all had an experience, and you've gotten through it. So you've played soccer, and Zach's played soccer, you guys played baseball, and football, and basketball. You can teach what you've been through, what you've learned, to another person who maybe doesn't know how to do it as well. And in that way, Paul is saying, it may be sports, it may be something else, we get to show God's love. Because in Jesus, the one who was born among us, the one we call Emmanuel, we get to see a brand new way of loving people. We haven't necessarily seen it before. It's a love that doesn't have any rules to it. It just embraces people. And so we get to participate in that when we teach somebody else how to do something that we've been through, something we're kind of good at. It's a lesson to be able to teach somebody. So when there's new people that join your teams and they're not as good, you should take time 
to help them learn how to play your sport that you're much better at, that you've played longer, okay? All right, let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for Jesus Christ. It was in Jesus that you showed us a brand new way to live and to love, to embrace and not push away. God, we pray that each day we would be able to use the love you taught us and show it and teach it to other people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture lesson this morning is from Romans 15 as we continue on this journey of hearing Christmas letters this time of year. Ordinarily, I, I read and teach from the New Revised Standard Version, uh, NRSV. As I was reading in preparation this week, I, I started to notice that the translation from NRSV was missing big important concepts that are, are there in the original Greek text. And so what I decided is I, I sometimes will look at uh, Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message, because there are often times where he will get the Greek a lot more correct. And, and for this message that Paul is writing, we, we really want to get it a lot closer because he's saying something very important. So this morning, uh, we'll hear from the message translation. Those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter and not just do what is most convenient for us. Strength is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? That's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles, but waded right in and helped out. I took on the troubles of the troubled is the way the scripture puts it. Even if it was written in scripture long ago, you can be sure it's written for us. God wants the combination of his steady, constant calling and warm personal counsel in scripture to come to characterize us keeping us alert for whatever he will do next. May our dependably steady and warmly personal God develop maturity in you so that you can get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with us all. Then we'll be a choir. Not our voices only, but our very lives singing in harmony in a stunning anthem to the God and Father of our Master Jesus. So reach out and welcome one another to God's glory. Jesus did it. Now you do it. Jesus, staying true to God's purposes, reached out in a special way to the Jewish insiders so that the old ancestral promises would come true for them. As a result, the non-Jewish outsiders have been able to experience mercy and to show appreciation to God. Just think of all the scriptures that will come true in what we do. For instance, Therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, would you pray with me for just one moment? Lord, speak to these people whom you love through your most imperfect vessel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If I've told this modern parable before, I apologize, but I'm going to tell it again. There once was a man who was walking down the road one day, 
And as he was walking, he fell into a hole. When he fell into this hole, it was, it was just too wide for him to be able to climb his way back up. And as he tried to claw through the dirt, he just kept falling back down. He couldn't get out. So he started to yell for help. And as he was down in this hole yelling for help, along came a doctor. And the doctor heard his cries for help and stood over the entrance to the hole. And the man yelled up to him, can you help me? And the doctor wrote him a prescription and threw it down in the hole and went on about his way. The man continued to be down stuck in this hole and yelling for help. And along came a minister who heard him yelling for help. The minister walked over to the hole and looked in. The man looked up and saw, and he said, can you help me? And so the minister wrote him a prayer and threw it down into the hole and went on about his way. The man is still stuck down in this hole, and he keeps yelling and screaming for help. And then this man's best friend was walking down the road. And he heard the voice, and he thought he recognized it. And he looked down in the hole, and the man looking up says, Joe! Joe, can you help me? I'm down here. And the best friend jumped down into the hole with his friend. And he said, are you crazy? Are you stupid? Now we're both down in this hole. And the best friend looked at him and said, he goes, yeah, I know. But I've been down here before. And I know the way out. That parable, I really think, truly encapsulates what it is that Paul is saying in this chapter to the church in Rome. We cannot avoid jumping in to the darkness, the hole that may appear in a friend's life, maybe even a stranger's life, simply because we're too busy. We've got other things to do. And we certainly cannot avoid it, as the little parable tells, when we do know the way out. We've all had experiences in our lives which are disquieting, upsetting. They frankly take all the peace out of us. Peace is a very interesting word. It's a very interesting concept word, to be honest. Because when we think of the word peace, we almost always think of a time when there is absolutely no conflict left in the world or in a given situation. But if we truly were to look at peace, peace is not the absence of conflict. It's learning how to live with it. Learning how to live with difference and with disagreement. In the Old Testament of the Bible, we, we call this word, we hear, we've heard this word for peace, translated as peace into English, shalom. We've probably all heard that word somewhere. And we translate it pretty cheaply and say, oh yeah, shalom, it means peace. Really, it's a concept. It's a much bigger word than just to say peace. Shalom is a word that points forward to the time when God's fullness will reign in the world. And there will be wholeness. And yes, conflict will cease. We heard it this morning in the reading at the Advent candle when the nations will stream to the mountain of the Lord and they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and they won't learn war anymore. But shalom is a much bigger concept. It is about wholeness of self. In the New Testament, this word shalom becomes the Greek word erene. And that's the word that Paul actually uses here in Romans 13. And arene, again, can be translated pretty cheaply as peace. But again, it's a much bigger concept. But by the time of Paul's writing, it's no longer just talking about when God's fullness will reign in the world. Instead, arene is looking at the time when the nations will stop fighting each other. It's looking at political peace as well as just individual human peace. But in our individual lives, when we don't lack peace, or when we lack peace, excuse me, we are all torn apart. We don't feel whole. We feel broken. We feel fragmented. We feel separated. We don't feel like our whole selves any longer. For some people, the death and the grief of that death can lead to a lack of wholeness or a lack of peace. 
For other people, it might be an addiction in their own lives or in their families. For other people, it may be marital discord. It might be a friend who lied to you. It could be literally anything, but it causes a fracture in our lives, which causes a rip in the human community. It can cause us to suffer. It can cause us to be anxious and sad, depressed, despondent, removed from human community. We don't know where we fit in any longer. We don't know how to interact with people anymore. How many people have ever felt that way, the way I just described? Right. Some of you feel that way right now today. So when you raise those hands, if you were to look around, you'd realize I'm not the only kid in class that's not getting it. I'm not alone. That's what Paul is pointing to as he talks in Romans 13. It is about a community that is working for and seeking wholeness and peace. Well, why? Because they'll all get along a lot easier? That's a pretty good uh, side effect of the, of the issue. Yeah, they'll all, they'll all get along. What's the bigger reason, Paul says? He says it's because God decided to act this way. Because God chose to wade right into the midst of all of that fracturedness, all of that brokenness, all of that unwholeness. In words similar to the parable we started with, God decided to jump down in the hole with us. Because God knows how to get out of that hole. So why is it in our communities, our churches, our friend groups, where we work, people we hang out with, whatever, why don't we always offer to help somebody with that? When somebody has struggled with, uh, let's, take, let's take an addiction, for example. When somebody has struggled with that in their own family or in their own life, and we have too, we know what that feels like. We know what it's like to say, yeah, this is hard. This is tough. This is a struggle. Why not enter into that struggle with them? To bear one another's burdens, as Scripture tells us. And in that way, it goes on to say, you will fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Well, I think Paul is telling us what that is today. To wade out into the middle of those troubles. To go right where the hurting is most and to do what we can, the best we can, to alleviate it and to bring wholeness again. When I used to work in, in behavioral health, there was a, a, a saying that they taught us in grad school, the saying you should never use. I know how you feel. Don't ever use that phrase. But I one day had to lead a group called Women Healing from Trauma, which is rather interesting because... Right, But my colleague was going out of town on vacation and needed somebody who was a specialist in trauma to help lead this group, and so I, I went. And a new member of the group came and joined the week that I was leading the group. And she started to tell her story. And each one of the women in this group of 10 said, almost in unison, I know how you feel. And it worked out really well because there's this strange thing about people who have survived the trauma. They do know how each other feels. They do know what that's like. And so they speak a similar language. They have almost a vocabulary that is identical. And so in that situation, the phrase, and amongst that community, I know how you feel, made perfect sense. And it brought wholeness to the group. This new woman who didn't know any of these people before, she had never been in this situation. It was something that had happened to her fairly recently. She didn't know what to make of any of this, but here were these other women that said, it's okay here. We are going to wade out in the midst of your fracturedness, your brokenness, your pain, your hurt. We're going to go out there and join you in it. And we're going to bring you back with us. They were willing to go out into the messiness to bring some peace, some shalom, some irene, some wholeness, 
to this one woman's life. In, in AA and, and NA, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, they have the 12 steps. And the last step is a very interesting step. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we have decided to carry this message to other alcoholics and to practice these uh, principles in all of our affairs. Alcoholics are willing to go with other alcoholics to help them to stop being alcoholics. And you think about the life of a person who is addicted to alcohol or other drugs. Who is left in the world who cares about them? Other alcoholics and addicts. Because most of the time they have burnt every bridge they ever had. And so there's nobody left. But there is this one group, this one group that helps to bring hope and healing and peace and say we realize all that other stuff, but you are always welcome here. You are always welcomed in this community. We will always love you without judgment. We welcome you openly and we want to help share our story with your story. They do this because they have spiritual principles. Maybe they're not exactly what we have or what we believe, but they do believe that some sort of higher power, whether it's God and Jesus or something else, is at work in the midst of building up that community to make it a place of wholeness and hope and peace. So what is it that we as people of Christ, Christians, what is it that we have to do? What is it that we should do? Well, we've got to be willing to suffer with other people. To enter into that struggle. Whether we know what it's like from our own experience or whether we have no idea, a willingness to be in an uncomfortable place with somebody else. A willingness to, to go out or to jump down in a hole if we know the way out. A willingness to be uncomfortable because, as Paul said it, the strength that we have learned, and that's kind of an interesting word he uses there in Romans about the strength because the word actually, when you translate it, it means those who have gained strength by faith through perseverance. It's a really long translation, but that's really what it means. Put simply, people who have been through some stuff, they gain faith. That's where their strength came from is having been through some stuff. And the other people, well, they haven't got, gained that faith yet. They're not sure of what to do. They're not sure of where to go and how to handle this. They're lost. They're scared and confused. So wouldn't it make sense that those who have been through some stuff, who have figured the way out of the hole, would jump in there with people who are lost and scared and cut off and say, it's okay. Okay. I know the way out. I've been here before. It's also interesting that no English translation of this Romans passage handles the very first word in Greek. That very first word is actually, we owe it to. It's a small English phrase. We owe it. We who have persevered. We who have gotten through some stuff owe it to those who are still struggling, who are still suffering, who are still cut off and not whole. We owe it to them to share this good news of what we have experienced, about how we in our own lives have seen a God who is willing to not just sit at a distance, not just stay away, not just throw a bunch of rules in our face, but a God who is willing to put on our broken human flesh in this one called Jesus, to be born amongst us, to live as one of us, to be tempted, to suffer, to experience hunger and loneliness and sadness and grief and anxiety and pain and all these things. We know this good news and that's what helped us get through. Our faith in this God, that's what we can share with other people who are still lost and still scared and still don't have any clue of where to go. We can come alongside them and say, I will walk with you through this dark place. 
I will stand down in this hole with you until we're both rescued, but I'm not going to leave you alone. This is the time of year when people's grief and depression can become the worst. Many of us are fortunate to still have our spouse living with us. Others of us are not so fortunate. And those are the ones that we always have to look out for, that we have to show extra care and extra love to. This may be, for people that you know, people in this church, the first Christmas without a family member because they've died or the relationship is so broken there's no hope of restoration anymore. But this will be the first Christmas when they don't get to share it with that person. Imagine the suffering and the pain that they're going through. For other people that we know, this could be the first Christmas that they've been unemployed and they don't know when they're going to be hired again. They're afraid that the children aren't going to have a very nice Christmas morning. And so our faith says, let me walk alongside you in this. Let me do what I can to bring you comfort. Let me offer you compassion, which is what God reveals in Jesus. Compassion, the Latin word copacio, to suffer with. To intentionally say, I don't have to do this, but I'm going to choose to do this. Because God did not have to suffer with us and for us, but God chose to do it anyway. I want to share that kind of love. This is the time of the year when that is most important in our communities, amongst our people. In doing these things to suffer with, to be present with someone who is suffering, who is not whole, who is broken, to offer them a word of hope is to really work toward God's peace. It's to join God in that wholeness building that is being started and worked out in Christ. The ultimate work of Christ is to bring the world back to its wholeness, to its fullness where there is shalom in Irene, in the world, where there is peace in every relationship and with every person and in every situation to bring wholeness back to that. We can join in Christ's work of doing that peace-building work or we can ignore it. We can sidestep it and say, but I'm far too busy. I've got to go bake cookies and I've got to go wrap presents and I've got to go to my 12th Christmas party this year. We could say, you know, I'm going to stop all that because I see this one person suffering. I see this one person who has no peace in their life and I want to go join them in it. I want to help to try to bring some hope to their life. I want to help to bring some peace to their life. I want to share this good news about this God that I love and serve. I want to do that. That's how we bring peace more fully to the world. That's how we make Christ more fully known in this world. Our very lives become evangelism. We share good news. We share hope. We point people forward to the world as it will be. And we say, until that time, until that time when Christ returns, I'm going to walk alongside you. I'm going to join you in this suffering. I don't have to. I frankly gain nothing from it. But I want to. I desire to. Because I just can't stand it one more minute to watch you suffer alone. So I'm here with you. The presence of Jesus in your life. Friends, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, you did not have to come into this world. You did not have to take on our flesh. You did not have to wade out into the midst of darkness and brokenness. You did not have to take the cross. But you chose to. You freely chose to become one of us to live as one of us, to experience our life. You freely made that choice. The only thing that we can give to you is our thanks. And we can commit our lives to your work, to be led by your Holy Spirit, to bring peace more fully to this world. 
in every relationship, in our own hearts, in our homes, among strangers and friends, to help to show that there is still hope in you, our God. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, it is this time of year when we contemplate what it means for you to become one of us, to be our Emmanuel. We pray for the strength, the courage, and the wisdom to be sent out as your ambassadors in this world, doing your works of love, sharing the hope of your presence, and granting words of peace and wholeness. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, fall upon us this day that we may be good, your good and faithful disciples sent out far and wide to do your holy work in this world. We ask these things in your most holy name, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. Amen. There's a quote from Julian of Norwich, who was a, a woman, uh, a, a female theologian, a mystic, a, a contemplative, beautiful. And she said, and she was speaking about the coming of God, and all shall be well. All shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. It goes really well with that last song. In the coming of our God, all will be well. All manner of things shall be well, because there will be peace and ultimate love in this world. But until that day, we are being sent out to be the vessels of Christ's love in this world, to share the hope and the good news of Jesus, our God living among us. So friends, go out from this time and from this place to do all the things good and holy and peace-bringing that Christ puts in your way. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.